In the summertime, there is no better place to be than the island of Sodor. The engines are happy to show holidaymakers the wonderful sights to be seen. But this year, there was a problem. Thomas and Emily were in the foundry for repairs. I need to find a way to carry more passengers, grumbled the fat controller. We have more holidaymakers. And fewer engines, said Emily. A double-decker problem, added Thomas. Double-decker problem, hmm. This gave the fat controller an idea. He drove straight to Bulgy's field. Bulgy is a double-decker bus. He was turned into a hen house after he caused a silly accident. Good news, Bulgy. I'm putting you back on the road. Thank you, sir. I'll be the best boss ever. Bulgy never liked being a hen house anyway. The next day, he went to the foundry. Bulgy, exclaimed Thomas, what are you doing here? I'm being repaired. I'm going back on the road. I think you'll be helping the new farmer, said Emily. He needs to deliver his vegetables around the island. Vegetables? Huh. I'm going to carry passages. Soon Bulgy would refit it inside and out. He looked smart and shiny. Even James was impressed. Mmm. When Bulgy returned to his field, the hens thought the old house looked splendid. We'll start in the morning, said his driver. You'll stay here tonight. Bulgy was soon fast asleep, but the hens missed their old home. One by one, they crept aboard. And went to sleep in the luggage racks. Bulgy knew nothing. The next morning, he picked up lots of passengers. All aboard he tooted and set off for the station. He was driving so smoothly that the hens didn't wake up. All was well until Bulgy turned the corner. Trevor the traction engine was pulling a hay cart. Get out of my way! He overtook Trevor. Bulgy swerved, the hens woke up, the passengers panicked, and Bulgy's driver lost control. The hens were frightened. They flapped, they squawked. Stop! cried Bulgy's passengers. We want to get off! The passengers were covered in feathers and broken eggs. They were very cross. This bus is full of hens, they complained. We shall tell the fat controller. It's not my fault, sulked Bulgy. The fat controller sent Bulgy to be cleaned. Silly hens, silly passengers. You can have them both. Mm, the farmer still needs help with his vegetables said Emily. A vegetable bus? That's not such a bad idea. And we're back carrying passengers, smiled Thomas. Bulgy is happy now. He has new green paintwork and a smart serving hatch. The fat controller agreed he could become the island's only vegetable stand on wheels. Bulgy likes carrying vegetables. They don't lay eggs and they never complain. Harold the helicopter is glad not to be a steam engine. He is much happier flying in the sky than racing along road or rails. One morning, the engines were busy preparing for the vicar's annual fete. I'd like to help called Harold, but I'm on patrol. 
He was looking for engines that might be in trouble. Meanwhile, the engines puffed to and fro with their loads for the fate. Percy was delivering deck chairs and decorations, tables and tea urns and reminders. Don't forget to come to the vicar's fate. Thanks for the invitation, called Harold, but duty calls, and he whirred away. Harold was landing at his airfield to get more fuel when he saw Pegasus, a cart horse that lives close by. Pegasus was getting ready to give rides to children. He had a shiny leather harness and a freshly painted cart. Harold was beginning to feel left out of the celebrations. He wished more than ever that he could help. Thomas puffed in with some passengers. Where are you going next? buzzed Harold. To the vicar's fate, of course. Isn't everyone? Everyone except me, replied Harold. I'm on duty. Yes, indeed, said Thomas kindly. Being a rescue helicopter is important work. But no one needs rescuing, sighed Harold. Then came the surprise. Harold's pilot received an urgent call from the FAC controller. Pegasus is stuck in a ditch. If he doesn't get to the vicar's fate, the children will be disappointed. You must rescue him at once. All set and ready for action, reported Harold. Pegasus, wondered Percy. That's a funny name for a horse. It's the name of a flying horse in a very old story, explained the Fat Controller. Flying horse, exclaimed Percy. Horses can't fly. He felt very clever. Harold flew to the rescue as fast as he could. What happened? he asked Thomas. We were loading the cart. Pegasus wandered off into the ditch, silly horse. Now he's stuck. If you can take him, I can take the cart. I'll put Pegasus in my sling. We need to hurry, whistled Thomas. The fate is about to begin. Soon Harold's pilot had fitted Harold's sling under Pegasus. Then Harold gently lifted him into the air and carefully carried him across the fields. When Percy saw Pegasus flying through the sky, he was amazed. Flatten my funnel so horses can fly after all. The children cheered for Harold. He had saved the day. Soon Pegasus was hitched up to his cart. The fate was a big success, and the children had a wonderful time. Harold was happy. He stayed on duty and had fun at the fate too. The engines on the mountain railway were excited. They were helping to build a new line. It would take visitors to even more beautiful places on the island of Sodor. The FAC controller arrived with important news. The grand opening is this afternoon. I will see the new line from the air. Lady Hat and I will arrive on Harold the helicopter. Just then, Scarloe chugged in. You're late for the announcement complained the Fat Controller. Really useful engines are never late. I'm sorry, sir. At the airfield, there was another problem. Engine trouble, said the pilot. Harold's not going anywhere today. Lady Hat was most upset. But I've been looking forward to the grand opening all week. And I, my dear, will find a solution. 
And he did. Topham, you cannot be serious. Me, ride in this. The wind direction is perfect. We'll be there in no time. Soon the hot air balloon rose into the sky. But Scar Lowy was upset. All this extra work is going to make me late again. The hot air balloon was floating peacefully through the sky. Lady Hat was enjoying herself. The new line looks splendid, she said. Thank you, my dear, replied the fat controller. Down the track, the workmen were still loading their ladders. Hurry up, hurry up, Scarlowy puffed. If Scarlowy doesn't hurry, sighed the fat controller, he'll be late again. All the engines were ready for the grand opening. Where's Scarlowy? Rusty asked. He promised to be on time, said Peter Sam. At last, Scarlowy was on his way. Then there was trouble. The balloon's flame suddenly went out. The air in the balloon cooled and the balloon started to fall. <coughs> Hold tight, the pilot called. I want to get out, demanded Lady Hat. Not now, dear, said Sir Topham Hat. The balloon's going to land in the tree, cried Scar Lowy. And it came down right in front of Scar Lowy. There's the fat controller. My hat is ruined, cried Lady Hat. Sure is mine, said the fat controller. Don't worry, called Scarlowy's driver. We'll soon have you down. Am I glad to see you, Scarlowy? Thank you, sir. Before long, Sir Topham and Lady Hat were safely on the ground. They boarded Scarlowy's boxcar and set off at once. Everyone was waiting as Scar Lowy brought his important passengers to the grand opening. The fat controller declared the new line open. With special thanks to Scar Lowy, he said, for helping us get here. Everyone cheered. Even so, you were still late, teased Rusty. I know, said Scar Lowy, but because I was late, the fat controller was right on time. It was May Day, and the engines were celebrating. They knew there'd be music and lots of fun. The station was being decorated. The fat controller said that the engines could be too. I'm going to have flags and streamers, whistled Percy. I'm going to have a big red banner, whistled Thomas. What decorations will you have, Gordon? asked Murdoch. Decorations aren't dignified for an important engine like me. I pull the express. Gordon was feeling insulted. Silly little engines, he grunted. Thomas was enjoying himself. He was bringing the maypole. The farmer's children waved, and Thomas peeped happily as he passed by. Soon it was time for the decorating. 
Percy's driver was wrapping streamers and flags around his funnel. Thomas had a big red banner on his tanks. Even Murdoch was being decorated, although he was very shy about it. We could have a competition for the best dressed engine, suggested James. Just then, Gordon shunted in. A competition, he puffed. I'm bound to win any competition. You'll have to be decorated, said James. This is a best dressed engine competition. Not me, puffed Gordon. You'd never catch me looking so ridiculous. The engines felt splendid. But not Gordon. He was cross. Decorations aren't dignified. Huh. Who cares about a competition anyway? Further down his line, a colourful banner was strung across the bridge. Then, as Gordon steamed across the bridge, it came loose and wrapped around his firebox. He couldn't see the line ahead. Gordon tried to whoosh the banner off, but the banner wouldn't budge. I can't see, he whistled loudly to his driver. Stop! You can't stop, Gordon, his driver called back. You're the express. Trevor the traction engine was chugging slowly along with his load of apples for the children's apple bob. Trevor heard a whistle. He was going as fast as he could, but it wasn't fast enough. The apples were all smashed. James was the last engine to join the competition, or so he thought. Here comes Gordon! cried the passengers. We didn't think you wanted to be decorated, teased Thomas. I didn't, puffed Gordon. Well, he's definitely the best dressed engine, said James. All the engines agreed. Gordon was secretly pleased but he didn't think it was dignified to say so. Silly Gordon. It was a sunny day on the island of Sodor and all the engines were working hard. Gordon was feeling very excited. Morning, Thomas. I look my best and you know why? Why? Because a Duke and Duchess are visiting, the Fat Controller will be choosing me as their special engine. Pa! puffed Thomas. After Gordon had been washed and polished, he rushed away to meet the visitors. But a signal diverted Gordon into a siding. He was very upset. I'm going to be late, he muttered. A huge engine rocketed by. Steaming pistons! Who's that? Gordon soon found out. When he arrived at the shed, the huge engine was humming quietly. Mm. Who are you? This is Spencer. He's the fastest engine in the world. Huh. But secretly, Gordon was impressed. I'm the Duke and Duchess's private engine. I take them everywhere. Quiet. There will be a party for our guests at Marin Station. That's far away over Gordon's Hill. You'll need to take on plenty of water, muttered Gordon. I have plenty of water, wished Spencer. And he raced away. I was only trying to be useful, grunted Gordon. (whistles) 
Spencer showed the Duke and Duchess many beautiful places. But he never stopped once to take on more water. Gordon and Thomas were collecting passengers when Spencer raced through on his way to the party. Don't forget the water! Who cares? He'll be in trouble soon, sighed Thomas. And Spencer was. He ran out of water on Gordon's Hill. Why didn't I listen? sighed Spencer. The Fat Controller soon heard the news. I'll send Gordon. When Gordon arrived, the station master was waiting. You need to rescue Spencer. He's stuck on the hill. Hurry, Gordon, said his driver. Gordon was looking forward to seeing Spencer. Run out of water, he teased. Yes, snapped Spencer. I must have a leaky tank. Perhaps, smiled Gordon. But we'd better hurry. Everyone is waiting. Gordon switched to Spencer's line and was coupled up. Then... They set off. See, said Gordon, we're right on time. Spencer was embarrassed. What do you think of Spencer now, whispered Thomas. Too much puff and not enough steam. Well, John said the Fat Controller. You're the fastest engine on Sodor. I know that, muttered Gordon. It was Christmas time on the island of Sodor. The Fat Controller's engines were busy. The snow made their journeys difficult. They had to work hard to deliver passengers and goods to their destinations on time. This made the engines feel very reliable. Elizabeth pulled into the fitter's yard with Thomas's snowplow. I don't need that silly old thing, huffed Thomas. Stuff and nonsense, steamed Elizabeth. You can't be a reliable engine if you can't get through the snow. That made Thomas cross. You know I'm reliable. I just don't like my snowplow. Elizabeth is rude, Thomas chuffed, and this snowplow makes my buffers ache. Later, Thomas saw the Fat Controller talking to Elizabeth. The Shodar Pudding Factory is snowed in. Their Christmas puddings must get to the docks before the ship sails for the mainland. Let me do the job. I need you on your line. Besides, Elizabeth knows those roads well. She's very reliable. I'm reliable too, huffed Thomas. Apparently not reliable enough, Elizabeth chuffed. <laughs> now Thomas was crosser still. The snow was heavy, but Thomas arrived at every station right on time. Elizabeth was struggling to stay on the road. Her wheels did not like the slippery ice at all. When Thomas arrived at the docks to pick up Terence, he was surprised that Elizabeth had not returned. The ship will miss the tide, said the dock manager. And the children won't have their Christmas puddings. Thomas, go and look for Elizabeth at once. Yes, sir, answered Thomas. Perhaps Elizabeth isn't so reliable after all. At the pudding factory, Elizabeth was piled high with crates of Christmas puddings. 
The fat control is counting on me. I mustn't be late. She chuffed onto the icy road. Suddenly, she was on a steep hill. Her driver applied the brakes. Elizabeth slid out of control into a deep snowdrift. Poor Elizabeth. Thomas and Terence puffed through the swirling snow. They couldn't see Elizabeth anywhere. Soon, they spotted her driver. He was standing by the level crossing. Elizabeth is stuck under the snow, her driver explained. I need help to dig her out. Terence rescued her in no time. We'll have to hurry, said Thomas. It wasn't your fault, Elizabeth. It's the slippery roads. Elizabeth felt much better. Thomas chuffed and puffed as fast as he could. They reached the docks just in time. The fat controller was delighted to see the bakery crate and that Elizabeth was safe and well. We'll get you unloaded immediately. Now the children will have their Christmas puddings, said Thomas. Well done, said the fat controller. Oh, thank you, Thomas, said Elizabeth. You and I are both reliable. Thomas agreed. There are many beautiful places on the island of Sodor. The engines love the pretty water mill, the peaceful canals, and the castle on the lock. Toby's favorite place is the old windmill. The windmill is warm. It cannot make much flour now. Toby loves to watch the sails go round. And the miller is his friend. Good morning, Toby. One day, Toby was collecting a load of flour to take to the market. But he was so busy watching the windmill sails that he forgot to look where he was going. The flour was damaged and the miller was upset. If I can't sell my flour, I'll have to shut down the windmill. I'm sorry, sighed Toby. Harvey arrived to put the trucks back on the track. Toby was sad. What will the miller do if his mill shuts down? It's a shame, said his driver, but we must hurry, Toby. There's a storm on the way. Toby couldn't sleep that night. It wasn't the thunder and lightning that kept him awake. He was still worrying about the miller. That stormy night, the old windmill was struck by lightning. The next morning, Toby chuffed carefully along his branch line. The storm had torn trees from the ground and farm buildings had been damaged. Then Toby saw the most shocking sight of all. The windmill is broken, he cried. This means the end of my business, said the miller sadly. I can't afford the timber to make repairs. Toby really wanted to help. There must be a way. Suddenly his driver saw a fallen tree ahead. Harvey and Terence were clearing the track. The fat controller was cross. This storm has caused confusion and delay. Remove this tree immediately. But Toby had an idea. Please, sir, the windmill has been broken. 
The wood from this tree can mend it and make it work again. A splendid idea, agreed the Fat Controller. Toby proudly took the tree to the miller. The miller was delighted. Now we can build our windmill back up again. It will be as good as new. Toby watched as the work began. It took a long time, but at last the new windmill was completed. The Fat Controller was most impressed. The miller was grateful. Thank you, Toby. Your idea saved my windmill. Toby beamed happily. Now the windmill produces more flour than ever before. And Toby makes twice as many deliveries to the market. He never tires of watching the sales go round. And he is very proud that the miller now calls it Toby's Windmill. Donald and Douglas are Scottish twins. They enjoy working on the Fat Controller's Railway. But sometimes they long for Scotland, their old home. One day, the Fat Controller called them to the docks. Lord Callan's castle is finally reopening. There is to be a grand celebration tomorrow. I need you to take the banners, bunting and bagpipes to the castle. Harvey, you must load them straight away. Yes, sir, chuffed Harvey. The twins were excited. Going to Lord Callan's castle would be like going home again. Soon, Harvey had finished loading the trucks. Where are you going? asked Percy. Lord Callan's castle, Donald proudly announced. By Castle Lock. I'm glad I'm not going to Castle Lock, wished Percy nervously. Scared the monster might get you, teased Douglas. He might, said Donald. There's no monster. There is two. There is not. Is two. Is not. Is two. Lord Callan's castle is in Misty Valley. Donald and Douglas were determined to get the important goods to the castle on time. They puffed proudly around the lock toward their destination. There it is, cried Donald. We're almost there, shouted Douglas. But there was trouble ahead. Trees had fallen across the line. Donald and Douglas stopped just in time. Then suddenly, there was a loud crash. The brake van had been hit by a landslide and come off the rails. They were stuck. We could take the causeway, said Donald's driver. Douglas's driver knew the causeway was old and rickety. It's too dangerous, he said. The twins were worried. We'll never get to the castle now, chuffed Donald. I'll call for help, said Douglas's driver. Splendid outfit, sir. The Fat Controller was trying on his present from Lord Callan when he heard the news. Donald and Douglas, trapped by the lock, he said. I'll send help as soon as I can. But the hours passed. It grew dark and cold, and still no help had come. Suddenly, the twins spotted something strange through the mist. What's that? called Donald. Is it the monster? cried Douglas. But 
For sure it is, answered Donald. It's not. It's us. It was Harvey and the breakdown crane. Donald and Douglas were relieved. By morning, the lines were clear. Donald and Douglas hurried off to the castle. Lord Callan's workers were waiting to unload the trucks. Soon the castle was decorated and the opening was a great success. Lord Callan was pleased. Ah, a splendid pair of engines. And very useful, added the Fat Controller. Okay, agreed the twins. Reneus is a brave little engine who enjoys working in the mountains on the island of Sodor. Even though he is little, Reneus loves feeling like a really useful engine. One day, the Fat Controller came to see Reneus. I have a very important job for you, he boomed. An important job, cried Reneus. Oh, thank you, sir. You are to take some children up into the mountains. You must make sure they have a wonderful time and are back in time for their tea. Yes, sir, said Reneus, but he was worried. He wasn't sure he was good enough to make the trip special. When Reneus arrived at the station, the children and their teacher were waiting on the platform. How can I make the children's day really special? He said to Rusty. You know the mountains better than any engine, said Rusty. But Reneus wasn't sure his best would be exciting enough. He felt like a very little engine indeed. The Fat Controller had told Reneus' driver to point out all the beautiful sights along the way. This is Sodor Castle, called his driver. It's very special and important. Reneus saw the castle every day. He didn't think it was special or important. I must think of something exciting to do, he puffed to himself. This is Valley View, said his driver. And here's the viaduct. Reneus was still unhappy. The trip didn't seem wonderful to him at all. Must be special, must be special, he puffed. Meanwhile, Rusty was working on the rocky ridge line. Heavy rains had washed the ground from under the tracks. These lines are too bumpy and uneven, said the foreman. The tracks must be closed for repairs. Reneus was still trying to think of something that would make the children's trip special. He didn't know that the linesman had forgotten to switch the points. Suddenly, Reneus was on the wrong track. Oh no, this line is closed for repairs. Bust my buffers, chuffed Reneus. Be careful, cried Rusty. The tracks are very bumpy. Reneus whooshed down the mountain like a roller coaster. The children cheered. Reneus puffed up the rocky ridge with all his might. His carriage clattered and bumped and bounced along behind. And the children oohed and ahed. Reneus chuffed and puffed as hard as he could. He steamed across the trestle bridge. He was going so fast, the teacher nearly lost her hat. Reneus splashed under a waterfall. The children laughed happily. And the teacher covered her eyes. At last, they could see the station. Reneus was very tired and worried. What would the Fat Controller say? 
Phew, said the teacher, just in time for tea. It was the best school trip ever, cried the children. The fat controller wasn't cross with Reneus. He was happy too. You gave the children a wonderful trip. You really are a very useful engine. Oh, thank you, sir, puffed Reneus proudly. Reneus didn't feel like a little engine anymore. The engines love working when the sun shines. One day, Thomas and Percy were helping Salty at the docks, but Salty was worried. It may be sunny now, matey, but there be a storm coming. It may be sunny now, matey, but there be a storm coming. There be a fierce storm on the way, Cap'n, peeped Percy. Salty knew they were making fun of him. He felt sad. Later, the Fat Controller arrived. I want you to fetch Fergus from the smelters. His driver doesn't know the line. Aye, aye, sir, replied Salty sadly. Salty was glad he was going to the smelters. He didn't want to stay where he wasn't liked. What's wrong? asked Emily. Nobody likes being made fun of by silly tank engines. Goodbye. Emily knew she had to find Thomas and Percy immediately. Those be dark clouds, matey, whistled Thomas. There be a fierce storm on the way, Cap'n, peeped Percy. Emily was cross. It's no nice to copy the way others speak. You hurt Salty's feelings. We were just having fun, said Percy. We'll say sorry to him, added Thomas. But Salty was nowhere to be found. Thomas and Percy were worried. Fergus was waiting for Salty when he arrived at the smelters. Right on time, congratulated Fergus. Aye, but there's a storm coming, said Salty. We must hurry. Soon they were hooked up and on their way home. Salty was right about the storm. It was a fierce one. The ships at sea depend upon the lighthouse to keep them safely off the rocks. But now there was trouble. The lighthouse lamp has gone out, cried the captain. Salty and Fergus were fighting their way back through the wind and rain. Then Salty saw a lantern ahead. The lighthouse keeper was waiting for him. Our lighthouse lamp has gone out, our generator has broken. Salty had an idea. Fergus has a flywheel, it could power the generator. Hurry, shouted the lighthouse keeper. Fergus's flywheel was attached to the generator shaft. Without the lighthouse, the ship was steaming towards the rocks. Fergus was working as fast as he could. Finally, the generator came back to life. The lighthouse beam shone across the stormy sea once more, just in time. Harder starboard, matey. Salty's idea had saved the day. Fergus worked hard until first light. The next morning, Salty and Fergus chugged back to the docks. They were surprised to see a crowd waiting for them. Thank you, said the captain. You saved our ship. Well done, boomed the Fat Controller. Salty was very proud. We're sorry if we hurt your feelings, puffed Thomas. We were only copying you because we think you're grand. Then say no more, me arties, replied Salty happily. Now they will all work together and have fun together, as good friends should.
Oliver and Duck are great Western engines. They deliver goods and passengers when the roads are closed by deep snow. Oliver thinks snow is messy and cold. I'm a great Western engine, he chuffed one day. I shouldn't have to shiver. Begging your pardon, Mr. Oliver, said Toad, but I think snow is splendid. Harumph. Later, Oliver saw some children building a giant snowman for the winter festival. Each time Oliver passed by, the snowman grew bigger. And bigger. And bigger. And bigger. Just an observation, Mr. Oliver. Snow is magical. Pa. Finally, the snowman was complete. Oliver chuffed back to his warm, cosy shed. The fat controller was waiting for him. You have to return to the mountain village. Some goods are needed for the festival. But all this snow makes my wheels feel chilly. Really useful engines work hard, whatever the weather. Soon, Oliver was loaded and on his way. The snow was cold. It had frozen the points and diverted Oliver into the station sidings. Oh, shiver my boiler, cried Oliver. His driver applied the brakes. Is there a problem, Mr. Oliver? Yes! There is! That could have been a little smoother. Oliver felt awful. He thought the children would be upset about their snowman. Oliver's driver went for help. The fat controller was just leaving his office when he got the call. Meow. Doc will bring the breakdown crane first thing in the morning, he said. Oliver's driver returned and told him the news. I'll be out here all night, <laughs> moaned Oliver. I'm afraid so. Luckily, the village inn had a toasty warm room for Oliver's driver. But Oliver was getting colder and colder. His fire had gone out and his funnel was covered in icicles. <laughs> I was right all along. There's nothing magical about snow. <laughs> Toad was beginning to think Oliver might be right. Brrr. Next morning, the children saw the situation. Look, a little girl shouted. Our snowman has eyes in its tummy. No, it doesn't, laughed a little boy. It's Oliver. That gave the children an idea. When Oliver woke up, he was surrounded by happy children. Oliver's a wonderful snow engine, they cried. Oliver was so relieved that suddenly he didn't feel cold anymore. When Duck arrived with the breakdown crane, Oliver didn't want to leave. He was enjoying the winter festival so much. You were right, Toad, Oliver called. There are some magical things about snow. Perhaps, Mr. Oliver, shivered Toad. <laughs> Definitely. Arthur loves working on the island of Sodor. He is new to the railway and is still learning his way around. One morning he discovered the fishing village. The sun made the water sparkle and the seagulls called across the harbour. This was Arthur's favourite place. 
That evening, the fat controller came to the shed. There's going to be a new line to the fishing village. I have to decide which engine is going to run it. He paused impressively. Thomas and Percy looked away. They had enough work to do. Arthur hoped he would be chosen. Thomas, you will work on the new line. Yes, sir, said Thomas, but he really didn't like the smell of fish. Arthur was disappointed. The fat controller sent him to haul coal to the steelworks. That evening, Thomas was at the washdown when Arthur puffed in. Do I smell a fishy engine? He teased. Yes, huffed Thomas. Smelly fish, smelly new line. Arthur wished he could go to the fishing village instead of the steelworks. He'd be much happier than Thomas. The next morning, Thomas was still grumpy. The fisherman had caught lots of fish. Hurry up, said Thomas. I'm a busy engine. And a fussy one too, said the fisherman. Just enjoy the fresh, salty smell of the fish. Poo, puffed Thomas. Thomas steamed as fast as he could along the line. But there was trouble ahead. Some faulty points sent his trucks one way and Thomas onto the old pier rail. The trucks were delighted. He's fallen in the water. Luckily, Thomas wasn't hurt and the fish truck stayed on the tracks. When the fat controller heard the news, he checked his timetable. Arthur is the nearest engine. I'll send him right away. It was a hot day. The ice that was keeping the fish cold started to melt. I hope someone comes quickly, moaned Thomas. That fish will go off soon. Arthur was surprised to see Thomas in the tidal pool. Are you all right, Thomas? No, but I'll be much better when you take these fish away. The breakdown van will be here soon, called Arthur's driver. Arthur knew he had to hurry. He raced along the line to the docks. and arrive there just in time. Later, Arthur went to see Thomas at the fitter's yard. Thank you for helping me, said Thomas. Thank you, said Arthur. I wish I had the fishing village line all the time. Then tell the fat controller, because I don't like fish. That evening, the fat controller came to the shed. I need an engine to go to the fishing village while Thomas is being repaired, he said. Any volunteers? Me, Arthur blurted out. And please, sir, may I run on that line all the time? Thomas doesn't like fish, but I do. Then the line is yours, said the fat controller. Arthur was delighted. The next morning, he puffed into the fishing village right on time. The smell of fish was everywhere, but he was sure he had the most beautiful line on the island of Sodor. The engines on the island of Sodor were excited. A new park was being built. Everyone was working hard to get the job finished on time. Duncan was feeling impatient. Get a move on, slow coach, he puffed crossly to Rusty. You're so slow, I'll finish first, Duncan boasted to Scarlowy. Scarlowy was cross. A little later, he met Rusty at the new park station. Duncan thinks he's fast, Scarlow he steamed, but he's just a bossy boiler. Better safe than fast, Rusty agreed. 
Duncan drew into the station. He was all puffed up and pleased with himself. I finished first, he wished proudly. In that case, said the fat controller, I've got another job for you. You're to collect the elephant on the sidings and take it to the park. Yes, sir, chuffed Duncan. This elephant is very important. You must be very careful. When Duncan saw the elephant, he was surprised. Why, it's only a statue, he said. This is an easy job. You must wait for the brake van, said the station master. This statue is very heavy. Nonsense, huffed Duncan to his driver. I've pushed heavier loads than this plenty of times. Let's go, Duncan, said his driver, but we must be careful. So they left. But without the brake van. But Duncan wasn't careful. He was impatient. We'll show them how fast I am, Duncan whistled. We'll deliver this statue and I'll still finish first. Duncan started to speed up. Soon, Duncan was going as fast as his wheels could carry him. His driver was starting to worry. So he tried to brake, but Duncan was out of control. He was scared. He had never gone this fast. People waved and cars tooted as Duncan sped by. Suddenly, a tractor trundled across Duncan's line. Look out! shouted his driver. Slow down! whistled Rusty. I can't! Duncan cried as he shot past. Elephant Park loomed ahead. Duncan's driver applied the brakes. But it was too late. The statue flew through the air and landed in the lake. Luckily, nobody was hurt. In no time, the fat controller arrived. He was cross. I told you to be careful. You should have waited for the brake van, he said sternly. I'm sorry, sir mumbled Duncan. He felt very embarrassed. Duncan was repaired in time for the opening of Elephant Park. He was very surprised to see the statue still standing in the lake. Everyone loves the elephant in the lake, said Lady Hatch. Even if it was a mistake, added the Fat Controller. Hooray for Duncan's mistake, cheered the engines. Duncan blushed and went a deep shade of red. Hurry up! I'm a busy engine, huffed Henry. Goods arrive night and day at the docks. Sometimes Henry and the other engines work so hard that their axles ache. The fat controller brought in a new engine to help with the heavy workload. He was long and had ten drive wheels. He looked very strong. This is Murdoch. He's going to be pulling freight on the main line. Ahoy, Murdoch! shouted Salty. Welcome, Murdoch! called Harvey. You're the biggest engine I've ever seen! cried Thomas. You're a chatty lot, Murdoch said quietly. Soon, Murdoch was coupled to a long, long line of heavy trucks. His boiler strained, his wheels started to turn, and the mighty engine chuffed away. Murdoch longed for some peace and quiet. But everywhere he went, it was noisy and crowded. At the end of the day, Murdoch was looking forward to a good night's rest. But Salty and Harvey were full of questions. 
What's the longest train you've ever pulled? Have you worked Marseille? Have you ever crashed? Please, Murdoch chuffed. I want some peace and quiet, and I don't want to share a shed with chatterboxes. No need to be rude, huffed Harvey. We're only being friendly, mighty. The next morning, Murdoch collected another long, heavy train. This time, he chuffed into the beautiful countryside. It was splendid. At last, he had some peace and quiet. Suddenly, his driver applied the brakes. There were sheep on the tracks. The sheep escaped from that field, said the driver, through that broken fence. They tried to chase the sheep back. First this way, and then that way. They tried everything, but nothing worked. We'll never move these sheep by ourselves, complained the fireman. I'll go and phone for help, sighed the driver. Murdoch was very unhappy. The noisy sheep were spoiling his peace and quiet. The fat controller was enjoying afternoon tea when he got the call. Sheep? he exclaimed loudly. I'll send to be with the farmer immediately. The sheep were becoming noisier and noisier. Please stop groaned Murdoch. I'd rather be back with the chatterbox engines. Just then, Toby chuffed into view. Toby, exclaimed Murdoch, we're certainly glad to see you. Before long, the farmer and his dog went to work. And the sheep were soon safely back in their field. And Murdoch was on his way again. That evening, Murdoch parked between Harvey and Salty, but Murdoch spoke first. I'm sorry that I was cross, he chuffed. I'm very pleased to share a shed with you. And we're pleased to have your company, said Harvey. Aye, we are, added Salty. It reminds me of a story. Murdoch smiled. The sound of bar, bar, bar would have kept him awake, but a Salty story would send him happily to sleep. Thomas and Fergus, the traction engine, are friends. Fergus is the pride of the cement works. He knows all the rules and obeys them. One day, the fat controller brought devious diesel to the cement works. I need diesel to help for a while. Please show him around. Yes said Fergus unhappily. He knew that Diesel could be trouble. Later, Diesel was being careless. Not like that, snapped Fergus. Do it right. Don't interfere, sneered Diesel. You don't know the rules, retorted Fergus. Diesel was very annoyed with Fergus and started plotting a devious plan. Later that day, he pretended to have news for Fergus. The fat controller wants you to work at the smelters. Me? But I'm the pride of the cement works. Not anymore. The fat controller says I'm better than you, so I'm going to stay here. It's not fair. I love working here. But he knew that really useful engines have to do as they are told. Fergus and his driver arrived at the smelters. I want to go back to the cement works, wailed Fergus. None of the other engines like coming here. It's so scary. You're right, said his driver. Just then, 
the scrap diesels arrived. Hello, are you happy to be here? No, cried Fergus. His driver was scared too. Come on, Fergus, we're going to escape. And for the first time, Fergus broke the rules. The fat controller was enjoying a tasty supper of kippers when he heard that Fergus was missing. That's not like Fergus, there must be something wrong. I will send Thomas to look for him. Fergus and his driver turned onto a disused track to find a place to hide. Fergus was frightened. So was Thomas. He puffed up and down the line. He couldn't see Fergus anywhere. We could search the old mine track, said his driver. That line is dark and spooky, whispered Thomas, but he had to be brave and find Fergus. Fergus was on a siding. His fire had gone out. Then it happened. It's an engine, he cried. Fergus, whistled Thomas. Whatever are you doing out here? Hiding. Don't want to work at the smelters. The fat controller is going to be cross with me. He's not, cried Thomas. He's worried about you. Really? Of course, puffed Thomas. Fergus felt better. Thomas pulled Fergus all the way to the smelter's yard, where he knew the fat controller was waiting. Fergus, explain yourself. I ran away. It's scary here. Diesel told Fergus that you wanted him at the smelter's forever, said Thomas. Nonsense, Fergus. You are the pride of the cement works. I shall send Diesel to the smelters and you can go back to the cement works tomorrow. Oh, thank you, sir, said Fergus happily. Fergus knew he had a good friend in Thomas. And he was still the pride of the cement works. <laughs>